Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkies listeners, Molly here. I'm so excited for this very special episode. Before we get into it, don't forget to join the Sugar Free for Life Support I'm Sweet Enough Facebook group, and be sure to grab a copy of Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction by Dr. Vera Tarman. Join us in Toronto on October 21st, 2023 to get your copy signed. Okay, I promised a special episode. I only hope you smile and laugh as much as we did while spending time with this amazing trio of siblings. Welcome, CJ, Will, and Katie. Thank you guys so much for being here with us today. Clarissa and I are super excited for this. I wish everybody could see this. Like my face already hurts from how hard I've been smiling just in anticipation of getting to speak with you guys. For our listeners, we are here with the May family. We've got two sisters and a brother, and they're here to share with us what their experience has been like as a family on this journey of recovery and healing. And so I'm just curious to know, guys, if you just let us know, just start us off. We always like to know that personal story. Like, what was it like going sugar-free, flour-free? Like, what was it like getting into recovery? Or what was life like before that, you know, and bring us up to that moment? Hmm. All right. I'm the oldest, so I'll go ahead and get started first. I'm the oldest of the ones that are here. We do have another sibling, so I do have an older sister. Uh, For me, I think I've been in recovery for a lot longer than I thought I was in recovery. So I, I actually, this is CJ talking, incidentally. So for me, it started like I was always on a diet. For as long as I can remember, I have been on a diet and looking a certain way and being perceived a certain way was always really important. And so I would always go on the next latest craze diet kind of thing. And probably I was researching the next diet, which I think probably was keto at the time. And I looked, somebody on one of the keto boards recommended a book called, it's by Gretchen Rubin, and it's uh, Better Than Before. And in there, they had talked about moderators versus abstainers. And so I got the book and I read about it. it it's not a diet book or anything like that. It's just a general um, help book. And I was like, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I was like, it is so much easier for me to abstain from certain foods than it is for me to try to moderate them. But I had never heard of that before. I didn't even know it was a thing. And so that's when I started my um, research. For me, I remember always being on a diet and then I would go off the diet. I would just want to have like a normal something like at a birthday cake or a little piece of food or some kind of like, I was always really rigid. And then when I would want to be a little bit more lax, it was like I was off to the races again. And so it was constantly me trying to find my groove, but also wanting to feel normal. And I'm using air quotes. I wanted to feel normal, but at the same time, I didn't feel like I fit in really anywhere. So that was what it was like for me before I found recovery. This Katie, for me, I've had like a dual addiction that wasn't like full tilt Uh, For many, many years, like CJ, I dieted and always wanted to stay on the slimmer side. It was fine in high school, but once college came around, it kind of was harder to do. Um, I have a history of substance use, many substances, but most recently opiates and been sober from that for five years. But it didn't really all kind of catch up with me and become unmanageable. So where I I would put it in the addiction category until I think my daughter was around six or seven. So I was a single parent, had always been a single parent. And 
I guess life just kind of caught up with me, you know, and I couldn't manage it anymore. And that's when the drug use went completely off the rails or started to go off the rails for me. And then the food was right behind it because, you know, if you're going to have one, why don't you have both, you know? And then when I got sober from opiates, then the food really just piled on and I didn't even recognize it either. I was so busy saying, oh, you're not taking pills. You're not taking pills. You're doing your right. You're doing great. Here, eat some more cheese, eat some more cheese, you know? And it wasn't until CJ started with Sweet Sobriety and that I finally was like, okay, I need to get onto, you know, the food and the sugar because the noise from the food was louder, honestly, than the opiates were. Yeah. So this is Will. Uh, so I've only been coming to sweet sobriety for like a month and a half. So I went to the doctor and my A1C was 14.7 and my blood glucose was 440. And my, um, so anyways, that wasn't good. So they started talking about possibly checking me into the hospital and eventually chopping my feet off and, you know, diabetic, all this sort of stuff. And I'd had uncontrolled diabetes for 20 years or so, but this is the first time that it's manifested in that it was starting to show up. My skin was all splotchy and stuff. So because, uh, and the reason I came to Sweet Sobriety is because that uh, Katie and CJ had modeled behavior. I mean, they had really changed how they were eating and how they were living. And so I figured, hey, I'd just ask them. Awesome. So let us know, how was, what was it like in the beginning? How did you find the motivation to keep going? And has your recovery changed now from what it was in the beginning? So my recovery has changed a lot. And what it was like in the beginning. Well, first of all, I think when I first found out about food addiction and I was in recovery for um, alcohol dependency and I knew that the food was a problem, but the alcohol had kind of taken over. It was preventing me from doing the things that I wanted to do, to living my my life. And so I took care of the alcohol first. And about six months into alcohol recovery, I was like, okay, I'm at a place where I can address this, this food issue. And it took me another four months of trying abstinence before I could actually get abstinence. A couple of the tools that I used was I joined another 12-step group, even though I was in a 12-step program for for the alcohol. I joined another one for the food, and that was at the exact time, within a few months, Sweet Sobriety was doing their audit program, and I applied to be in the audit. And I was like, okay, I will do anything that will help me. The other thing is I kind of felt isolated because a lot of people had food issues, but nobody, everybody was addressing them with as a diet. And I was like, no, I know how to diet. I, like, I got that down. What I don't know how to do is live with a food addiction. And so for me, I wanted to figure out how to live dependent on food addiction, on food addiction, but I also wanted to live. Like, I really missed my life addiction had taken a hold of it. Now, granted, this was during COVID. So it was, things were very small, you know, during COVID. But at the same time, that's when my addiction really, because up until that point, I was pretty much a normal uh, drinker. You know, I could go and have, uh, it didn't prevent me from doing any of the athletic things that I enjoyed doing. But then when COVID hit, then it did. And I was like, hey, And so for me, after the, I started with sweet sobriety and I started figuring out why I was doing a lot of the things that I was doing, then it became less about the food and more about working on trying to better myself and also be helpful and model good behavior, not only for my siblings, but I do have four children. And since addiction does run in the family, I'm like, obviously you're talking to three of us. Addiction runs in the family. I knew that my children could also struggle in this area as well. 
and I wanted better for them. And so it became more about, and I am an older mom. I'm, I have a 15 year old and I'm 57. So I wasn't exactly one of the youngest mothers at the kindergarten, at the beginning of kindergarten for my fourth child. And I wanted to model something. I wanted to be around for them. And so I had to learn how to be the better version, becoming the better version of myself, learning how to have situations come up and be able to handle them without running to the food because that's exactly what I did. When my kids would transition in the afternoon, I never even realized I did this, but all the buses coming home because they were all in different schools and it was, I had to have a glass of wine and maybe some chocolate or maybe both just depending on the day and things would go wrong as they always do when you have multiple children. And that was my crutch. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm not going to use that as a crutch, what can I do? And so it was about learning to handle life on life's terms. So this Katie again, so like CJ, my beginning and recovery, you know, it's hills and valleys, right? So mine started about five years ago when I went into inpatient rehab for opiate addiction. And that was an acute phase, very traumatic, like just trying, your life has already been like the rug pulled out from underneath you. You're just trying to keep the cement floor there, quite honestly, you know? So I don't, yes, I did make some strides in like trying to recover in a life, but as far as being in recovery, I don't consider that being in recovery. Um, I was what a lot of people would call a dry drunk. It honestly, the emotional work that we were working on scared me to death. I hated just about every minute of it because all I did was cry and I am a strong independent woman and I don't cry all the time like that. I mean, I do cry, but like it was too hard to work on that. I was just doing it to protect my nursing license so that I could continue to have a job and feed my daughter. Right. So then I just replaced food for the opiates. And so I'm still not in recovery at all. And so about two years ago, I was after COVID, they came out with the first GLP one medication, Wagovi, and I got a coupon for it. And I started Wagovi and I didn't really change the way I ate. I just ate less, right? Because that's what it does amongst other things. And I lost like 40 pounds. And then I got COVID. I got super, super crazy sick, like in the hospital, ICU, all that stuff, right? On a bunch of steroids. Of course, I wasn't taking the Wagovi at the time. And by the time I got out of the hospital, I was ready to start. The coupon had expired. Well, what's going to happen? I didn't make any changes. I didn't have the medication anymore. Went right back to how life was, right? And so, you know, six months went on, I tried to alter the way I ate, but I didn't really have a program. And then I tried compounded Wagovi and that didn't work. And then, you know, I was really just right back where I was. So then Manjaro came out and I got a coupon for that. And I said, I have to do this differently. If I'm going to use the Manjaro and my analogy for it was like um, naltrexone, for, you know, the addict, it's a tool that you can use in your tool shed, but you have to change your behavior. You have to learn about this. You have to figure this out and you can use this as a tool, but it's not just the answer, right? So you've got to do these together. It took me a few weeks of being on it. And I finally reached out to CJ. And by the way, this whole time, CJ is poor thing. She's a prophet in her own land, screaming at the top of her lungs, like all the time. And I'm just like, would you please shut up? Like, I don't even want to hear it. Oh my God, just, I'm going to eat my cake. Just leave me alone, you know? Because when you, when you're not ready to hear it, you're just not ready to hear it. You know, I feel really bad. And I'm sorry, CJ, that you had to go through that. (laughs) But, uh, so anyway, got on the Manjaro a few weeks later, I started in sweet sobriety and, Um, it really, you know, it helped me. And, and so how has my recovery changed? I mean, I, it's not that my recovery's changed. It's, it's that my recovery started, honestly. And, um, I'm really grateful for that. So I, you know, I still have the struggles with the food that I have to address, but the things that I would have thought you would have worked on and rehab, the emotional things, the way of living, 
now that the food is not, you know, front and center and the opiates aren't front and center, now I can do that work. I feel like in rehab, like I just couldn't do that work. It was just too uh, traumatic and craziness, you know? So that's, that, that's where I am. Yeah. So I get, so only being involved for like six uh, weeks, I, I hate the term recovery. I hate addict. I hate meditation. I hate the group coaching. Wait, what do, what I do like? you like? Well, yeah, damn. I really dislike it. Everything. Uh, I do like Clarissa and Molly. Uh, so I guess I'm still struggling with that. In fact, uh, you know, I struggle with whether or not I'm even an addict because it was pretty easy. I mean, I was drinking three to four liters of Coke a day. So that sounds suspiciously like some sort of addiction, but I was able to quit it pretty, pretty quickly. One of the reasons why I was able to is because Katie and CJ were helping me. And by helping me, I mean bugging me every 30 minutes. Like, what the hell is going on here? I share my health data with them. So I would prefer not to have a conversation with them about why my blood glucose is over 200. So that's the consequence for me. It's not a, it's not a health. It's that over Fuhrer Katie is going to call me up and uh, send me off to the gas chamber. Cause if you're, uh, and sometimes she can, sometimes, you know, being in recovery with your siblings, sisters can be rough because it, I mean, Katie's had a, a couple of times. It's very interesting because CJ's been all lovey-dovey and, you know, you do your truth and stuff like that. And CJ, and Katie's has been uh, more like, uh, what the hell you are you doing? If you're not even going to work at it, you might as well get your feet cut off. She didn't say it that way, but I interpreted it. Well, um, CJ is farther into her recovery, so she's made more strides. I'm still rough around the edges, and, you know, I can be not nice. You're not wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and I'm always nice to you, so I don't know what the, where this animosity is coming mm-hmm. from, Katie. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyways, okay, whatever. But uh, I, um, I don't know. I'm still, uh, I'm still coming to uh, not grips or terms or whatever with the whole recovery language because I don't like it. Uh, but uh, so why do I still keep on coming? Because it's been helping. So I don't like it, but it's been helping. So there we go. I love it. Both things can be true, right? We don't have to like something that's actually good for us or is helpful for us. But if we want to have the outcomes that we're getting, we probably have to keep doing it or something similar. Sure. I wasn't uh, like some people. I mean, I'm a big guy. I was not unhappy with my clothes size or how I looked or stuff like that. I mean, what was it? Jeff Foxworthy said that when women look into the mirror, they see themselves as substantially worse than they are. And when guys look in the mirror, they see themselves as substantially better. Uh, so, you know, I can, like, uh, three was like 320. Uh, I was over 350 at one time. I'm looking in there, eh, kind of like Schwarzenegger. I could take off a few pounds, but, you know, eh, yes, I look great. So I wasn't really all that happy. I'm just unhappy with the consequences. Absolutely. So what is life like now? Like, what does that look like now that you're on this journey? whether it be years in or six weeks in, like talk us through what is like, like, is it better? Is it worse? And eh, eh, like, so, so what's it like? So I've been on the journey for a while. I mean, I've been alcohol free for over two years now, like I think two and a half years. So it's, it's been a while, although probably very small baby steps and it's kind of morphed. First I addressed the alcohol, then I addressed the food, but even the food, even addressing the food, and addressing what exactly was going on underneath it. Getting abstinent was a bit of a struggle. It took me a while to figure that out and to get my sea legs under me. And then once I was abstinent from sugar, flour, wheat, and I also did fruit and sweeteners, I just dove in. I was like, let me just figure this out. And so, and it, it went well, once I was able to get involved with sweet sobriety and I was doing a 12 step program as well, two 12 step programs. So I had a lot of support 
And that was, that was because where I had the problem was at home. And that was my, that was my safe environment. That's where I was eating and drinking. And so by having all of that support around me, I was able to leave my house quite frequently to go and get the support that I needed. And it got me out of the environment in which I was totally dependent on. And that was causing me this, the stress and the anxiety. And so once I made my home, like probably one of the biggest rewards from recovery is I got my house back. Not that anybody foreclosed on it or took it anywhere, but I just, what it wasn't safe for me to be at home. It wasn't a safe environment. I, um, and even now with the the children being here and they bring stuff in because my kids are 15 to 23, they bring stuff in the house, but it's not my food. So sweet sobriety and help me learn how to deal with those things because life keeps happening regardless of whether I want to be in recovery or I don't want to be in recovery or whatever recovery looks like is life keeps coming at you. And the things are the things that I was getting so stressed out, out about and had a lot to do with things I couldn't control. And I thought that they were in my control. So once I figured out that these things aren't actually in my control, and I still have to work a lot on that. But now the biggest thing that has happened to me in recovery is I have peace. I have peace around food. It doesn't control me. My food that I eat, I love it very much. It's really good food. But it is about the fuel for me. I like to be active. I'm extremely active. Um, I've just returned back to road cycling. I like to lift weights. I have a big family. Not only do I have four kids, but I have four dogs. And I have a husband. And I'm very involved with my church. So I'm very active and I love my life. And i that's what I was missing while I was caught up in all the crap. And I couldn't figure out how to how to get out of it because I didn't know about abstinence. I think if there's one big one thing that um, is that I didn't find out about abstinence sooner, but we all get here when we get here. And now I actually do eat fruit and I do eat potatoes because they help fuel my rides. And I do a lot better with those foods than I did when I first started in recovery. So not only has a lot of me changed, a lot of my activities have changed, a lot of the food has changed as well. And I have gone through keto to carnivore. And now if you looked at my diet, it's like 15% protein and 50% fat and 35% carbohydrates. And I guarantee you, if you'd have told me this, when I started this, I would have called you a liar. There was no way that was ever going to happen that that I just couldn't eat that way. But lo and behold, I was wrong and I'm thriving on that diet. So I'm just thrilled. So for me, it's like living when I wasn't before. So I kind of, I think I said this in um, one of the group coachings that I didn't realize that I had built myself my own little prison in addiction. And, you know, I would make excuses on why I didn't go for a walk or why I didn't want to, you know, because my daughter rode bikes too, why I didn't want to ride with her. And it's because I was carrying like 130 extra pounds. It's really hard to do anything. It's not that I didn't want to. I used to be a big hiker, big outdoors type person. And even though I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm at the same level as far as activity with CJ. I never really have been. She's more of an extrovert and I'm more of an introvert, but I, but I am, I'm kind of balanced. I'm a little extrovert and introvert. I'm a little of both. So, you know, nowadays I go out, I'm involved in things. I'm, I don't watch a lot of TV anymore. I'm honestly just too busy for that. Just working on other things that bring me a lot of joy. And I'm, it's like, just, it's like rediscovering like life because there were so many things that I just didn't do before. So, you know, I started weight training again. I'm really enjoying that. Although to sit down right now is a little painful and to bend over and pick something up. My hamstrings are not happy right now. 
but I'd go on walks and the walks weren't really for exercise. They weren't for body composition. They were simply to help keep my stress level at work in check. And, and they really still are. And like, I cherish that time because work is very stressful and I can, I'm in management. So of course it's stressful, right? Otherwise they wouldn't need managers. So that's not going away. So, you know, sweet sobriety and the coaching that I've I've gotten here has helped me give me the tools to deal with that stress without it being food or opiates or some other maladaptive behavior. Because I mean, honestly, I could slot in, there's about a dozen maladaptive behaviors we could just throw in there to deal with the stress. And I'm sure I've tried all of them, right? So, you know, I'm just like living, like CJ said, thriving, you know, I'm thriving in a way that I didn't really, I don't think I imagined it before. When I started, I just imagined wanting to look better, quite honestly, and feel better in my skin. And it's totally different now, just a whole different landscape in in a way that I could have never imagined. And I'm very excited about it. I mean, me and CJ are talking about, we, (laughs) she didn't, this is, she didn't say it this way, but I have this dream of this active vacation that I want to take. And I'm like, you're coming with me, by the way. Well, you're welcome to come too. Like go out west and do some kayaking and hiking and stuff like that. So when I was telling her about it, I thought for sure she was totally in on it. And she said, my dream is to do uh, road cycling on the rivers in Europe. And so I think she's like, I'll do yours if you do mine. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to get a road bike, y'all. And you know what? That's an option now where it wouldn't have been before. So I'm excited. Yeah. uh, Wow. I appreciate that invitation and I'm going to take a hard pass. If it does not, we have 2,000 years of Western civilization that has brought us a sport utility vehicle, and you want to go back to some sort of bipedal locomotion. No, thank you. If it doesn't involve a gar- golf cart, I don't want to do it. So how is my, uh, how's my life changed? Well, I've, I've changed, uh, I mean, the biggest thing was I've changed uh the three to four liters of coke a day i mean i didn't realize how much money i was spending on that it was pretty damn expensive uh it's not as expensive as the other coke habit but you know it's up there uh <laughs> and, uh, and uh, two uh 225 a bottle and i've changed uh i've changed what i eat i mean that's uh so i was looking at it the other day and i used to have on my truest app where you know it has where you've been and it's like chick-fil-a zaxby's blah 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 blah, blah, all of that and there'd be three four uh five entries a day and now there's one entry at Publix, so i just i just go to Publix and uh and get my stuff there so that's changed a lot. I hang out a lot with uh, middle-aged women way more now because uh, I think it's me and like three other guys that uh, come to the sweet sobriety. So uh, men, jump in. Uh, I'll be there to support you. I'm at the uh, at the vanguard into this uh, soup of estrogen. Uh, so you know that's that's interesting. And I talk a lot, but I don't talk about my feelings as much as I hear people talk about their feelings. And some of this conversation is a little spicy. And I hear about menstrual cycles and uh, relationships with their husbands. And I could have done without all that personally, but, you know, I'm growing as a person. So it's all a growth opportunity. I'm not sure I'm driving people to y'all's uh, website, so y'all may want to edit me out. <laughs> No, that's perfect because that is exactly what we talk about, right? Recovery in reality. And so I'm wondering if you guys can speak to what is it like to have a sibling in recovery with you? And like CJ, maybe you can speak to the fact that like, if you saw some behaviors that you maybe wanted to have conversations about or did have conversations about or will, what it was like to see like Katie and CJ kind of make this transformation or did you know? Notice, like, what is it like having that close connection recovery relationship with a sibling? I wouldn't have done it without them. I wouldn't have shown up with that group. And and to this day, I won't. I will not come to the uh, little group meeting unless Katie or CJ is there. That's so, good. So that makes uh, you feel safe. 
Oh God! See, that's another word. I hate there's that. a there's another word, a feelings kind of word. Yeah. No, it's just uh, I know them, and I know how they how they. Uh, I guess uh, I have a comfort level with uh, CJ and Katie, and also if I think they're full of shit, I'll just tell them to shut up. He does. Yes, he does. So he will show up on my free Tuesday meeting and call me out. Um, <laughs> so, um, nice. yeah, and, the, and it's a, I, I love having my siblings in recovery. So I guess in the beginning, when I was first in recovery, for me, it was, I wanted to help my family and, but I, I was probably a little pushy in the beginning. And then the more that I grew in my recovery, <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a, little, a little pushy. You're kind of like the St. Paul of uh, uh, sweet sobriety. Okay. All right. Listen, it's my turn to talk now. So, um, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, I just wanted them to be in recovery too, so that I wouldn't have to take care of them when they were older. So, that was my, my whole, my whole plot. But, um, as I, as I learned more in recovery and I learned more about myself, what I realized was that you can't shame somebody into recovery. And so, my little tidbits of information to help them were not perceived as I had hoped. So it was better if I kept a lot of them to myself. So even to this, to even now, and Katie and I, Katie will tell you this, because Katie, Katie lives down the street from me. Will lives in another state. But Katie, when, and Katie's at my house a lot. We have a lot of kids. There's lots of family events. We are a very close knit family. So I don't say anything about Katie's food, about what she's eating and what she chooses to eat. If she asks me, she's making a face at the camera you people can't see. If she asks me, then I will weigh in. But I don't, I'm not about to say, well, do you really think you should be eating that? No, I don't do that. If either any of my siblings ask me questions or my dad ask me questions or my sister, I will tell you really the funniest thing I will say about having a family this big and working so closely with them. The funny thing is, is I will get phone calls from one member of my family about someone else. And so what I've tried to do is go, you know, it's kind of funny that you're noticing this about the other person. Might you want to look at this area of your life? Because Everybody comes at it from a helpful, they want to help the other person. But the thing is, is the modeling is really the, probably the best thing. And that is really, really, really hard to do because you want to help and you want them not to have to go through what you've gone through and you want them to be healthy or to make better choices because you've already tried that and it didn't work for you. So Sometimes it's great. So, and what I really enjoy about recovery is I feel like I got my siblings back because we were all pretty, not that we weren't close, but we didn't, we didn't spend a whole lot of time together. And Katie's already admitted that she has a lot of other addiction. Well, one of them was a work. I mean, she was always working and I would, I and mean, she just lived around the corner from me. Well, let's go do this. And she would, she would say, I'll think about it. And in Katie's world, I'll think about it means no, I just, no. I can't, I just can't say no right now. So I'm going to say, I'll think about it. And so she started saying yes more. And she started saying and when she would say, I would think about it, sometimes the answer was yes. So that gave me hope because I really missed my sister. And we do have uh, her daughter and one of my daughters are the exact same age. So they're just two weeks apart. So we do spend a lot of time together and I missed, I missed my sister. And that was probably my biggest motivation in trying to get her in, other than the fact that I was scared that she was going to die because she had already died almost twice. I was terrified she was going to die. But the, the biggest motivation is I just wanted my sister back. I already forgot the question. What Sorry. is it like having your siblings in recovery with you? Uh, well, having CJ, it's great. I mean, sometimes she's got like a triple role. Sorry, I'm going to get to you in a second, Will. I thought I'd start with the most positive first. 
So sometimes she's a coach and I'll be like, Hey coach, I, what do I do here? You know? And she's like, go get the feelings wheel. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good to go. Right. Uh, which is great just to have someone with that wealth of knowledge and experience. And then sometimes she's my sister. Most of the time, that's the category she falls into who happens to be sober too. And I can just talk to her about a struggle and not necessarily just use her as a sounding board and not a solution based um, thing. And then the third thing is she's just my other sobriety friend, you know, that I can use as, Hey, I want to check in on this kind of thing. Uh, so it's great. I mean, our relationship is blossomed in a way again, because we've changed And now we have this whole element of growth where we're both growing together. So that's kind of cool. With Will, you know, I mean, I... So it's funny. I'm an educator at work, y'all. I mean, I train and educate. That's what I do. I said management, but it's mostly education. But it's a lot like what I was describing for CJ. You try to educate... Like when I was educating my brother, I remember it was probably three to six months ago and I was kind of drilling him about, hey, what are you eating? What are you drinking? Are you drinking Coke? And I could tell by the way he was answering that he was still, you know, drinking Coke and his blood sugars were probably out of control because he wasn't checking him. And yeah, I just laid in on him in a non-helpful at all way about all the awful things that can happen because I'm a nurse, right? So I know. And so I went over all the bad ones, you know, stroke, amputation, blindness, dialysis, heart attack. I'm like, which one do you want? And I did the same thing that CJ did. I was like, look, dude, you're single. I'm single. I don't have the capacity to take care of you. And I don't want you to go to, you know, some skilled nursing facility, you know, and what should be the prime of your life. Please don't do that to me and get it together. That was not helpful. That's not the way to deliver that message. And I love you, you know, and I don't want all those awful things for you too. So, you know, Will and I talk more than we did before. Because again, it's almost like you build your own little prison. And so you're not willing to to reach out to people and your life doesn't have as many dimensions. So, you know, the other thing, CJ pointed this out. I don't know that I would have recognized it. She's so, she's a lot more perceptive. Well, not perceptive, but just uh, sees things in, in other people in a way that I don't. It's just a strength of hers. But Will talk so much more confidently and competently when his blood sugar is under control. And so it's obvious in his voice, you know, you can almost tell by the way he's talking, the strength in his voice that, you know, he has that mental acuity. He can draw on all of his faculties because as you can tell, he's got a big old brain and lots to pull from. So anyway, that's all I got, Will. You can go. Uh, Katie, I'm I'm really going to think about going on that vacation with you. <laughs> I think you're lying. <laughs> you guys have me <laughs> nording. I'm laughing so hard over here. Oh, goodness. So, Will, did you want to add anything to that other than, you know, you go to meetings when your sisters are there? You know, what's it? It sounds like they share or you share your your health information with them. Is there anything you wanted to add after hearing what they had to say about what it's like having them with you on this journey? Uh, well, no, they're both uh, they're both uh, knowledgeable and they're both. I don't know. It's a it's the difference between you can go and and ask for help, but you don't know whether or not everybody says that they want to help you, but you know you know the CJ and KD want to help out more. Uh, now, I thought generally it was because of love, but apparently they don't want to be changing my diaper uh, when I'm, uh, you it's know, I can both. see that. It's dual. That's, uh, it's dual. Okay. So that's a, so that's a, that's good to know, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, to me, it's helpful. And the other thing is they always want to have these family get together and sit down and play cards. And I'm like, what is the point? But because I, I don't, I don't enjoy that sitting in a room and just having fun. This gives us something to talk about. Okay. So now, now I'm actually interested in what they have to say. 
instead of being invited to go to Disneyland and have fun. Okay, if I'm going to Disneyland, I'm going to the golf courses at Disneyland. I'm not hanging around with my 15-year-old niece, if that makes any sense. So I don't, I don't know. That's just, it's got to be, there's got to be some reason for it. So maybe that's a, maybe that's a man thing. I don't know. Sounds like you've got to be a reason. Yeah. It sounds like you found a reason to go. Yeah. So good. So the next thing we're going to do is we're all going to take up heroin and we can go into addiction together and then we'll have something growing up. No, no, we're not. I'm going to take a hard pass on that one. Hard pass. Okay. Well, I've, I've never, I've never, I was thinking, never mind. We're moving on. We are. I had a wreck four years ago, so I had, so I have a uh, traumatic brain injury, so I have problems uh, limiting what, what I say and the order. And Katie mainly calls me up to make sure that I show up to things like this. You're doing great. That wasn't a problem for you before filtering out your comments at all. Zero. Never a problem. Yeah, but I did, I did it on purpose. It was a purpose. Ah, uh-huh. okay. Now we, now we found out, CJ. <laughs> it's just figured out the last five decades of your childhood right now. <laughs> like, oh, uh, it was all on purpose. So talk to us about what goes into, you know, and I know, Will, you don't like this word recovery, but if you had to like sit down and just kind of lay out your day to day, like what are the things that go into your daily routines that really contribute to you sticking to the plan, like maintaining recovery and just continuing to have that peace and the freedom that you guys were talking about? Um, For me, it's about uh, preparation. So I actually prepare a lot for the, the next day the night before or the day before, just depending on, I kind of know what my schedule's like. Um, even though every day is a little bit different depending on, um, my kid's schedule and, and my husband's schedule. And so I generally, I'm kind of one of those people. I don't really get bored with food. It takes a while for me to get bored with food. So I typically eat a lot of the same things over and over again. And when I do get bored, then I'll change it. But I eat three meals a day. I don't generally snack. I will say though, if, if I've had a a really heavy workout or something along those lines, I will add more food if I'm hungry. So it, that has been probably one of the biggest changes for me because I was really good good at dieting and I was really good at, um, it had to be in a certain caloric intake or whatever the case may be, depending on what I was counting. And now it's about, okay, wait a minute. I am hungry. Wow. I I really did work out a lot, man. I do have a lot going on. I'm going to need some more fuel for to get through this day. So I generally eat three meals a day. I generally know the night before or probably even a couple of days beforehand, what I'm going to eat. I kind of call my refrigerator plug and play. There's different things in there and you pull it out and and this goes together. And then you can, if I run out of one thing, generally I always have something as a backup, you know, that's something that will, will work. And so I kind of know what I'm going to eat. I usually always know what my workouts are going to be. Y'all, some of you heard me mention I do run a free support group on Tuesday and I'm, and now I am a, um, a, gosh, I can't think of the word now. I'm certified addictions, food addictions coach now. So I do talk to several people in recovery on a daily basis. Typically, usually there's messages that go along with that, whatever I'm working on. I do like to do the uh, recovery programs that we do in Sweet Sobriety. If there's one, I almost do the monthly one, whatever it is. Uh, I do that one. I spend a lot of time I, on free on free time. I do meditations. I stretch. There's I have a list of things that's right next to my refrigerator of things that I enjoy doing that have really helped in my recovery. Meditation, stretching, exercising. I get plenty of water. Sleep has been a big priority. I was never good at sleeping until I got into really good recovery and just learning about sleeping and the different things. So actually kind of, it's kind of funny in recovery. I start thinking about sleeping when I get up. (laughs) And so what are all the things that I need to do that day that will help me get a good night's rest? And that actually after my prayers in the morning is the first thing I think of. And then I get going on what that will look like for the day. And while things, and I used to be very um, vigilant 
and very exacting. I had to hit these things. And now I don't. If I miss a day of meditation or if I miss a day of prayers, of my morning prayers or my evening prayers, if I miss you know, whatever the case may be, or if my food didn't come off exactly the way that I had planned it, then, you know, so be it. That's just the way that it is. The world is not going to end and I am going to be fine. So. Wow. So much of what CJ said, I totally resonate with. I tend to eat the same things over and over again, and eventually I'll get sick of one thing and I'll move on to the next. I have not gotten sick of eggs. When I get sick of them scrambled, then I fry them. And then when I get sick of frying them, then I poach them and then I boil them. And then I start back over with scrambled eggs. So I eat eggs almost just about every day. So there's always eggs. And that way I always have a safe food. I told CJ the other day, I was on a huge salmon kick. I was like, some I'm going to be hiking out in the woods and some bear is just going to come and attack me because they think I'm salmon, honestly. So I've moved on from salmon and now I'm on uh, ground bison. So I just keep a lot of safe foods in the house. That way, if I just have a little itch for something different, I have something there that's available to me. And I, I loosely plan out my day. I'm not a big breakfast eater. I've never been a big breakfast eater. I eat eggs for either lunch or dinner. It just depends on, it's my busy meal. So if I'm busy at work and I'm working from home that day, then I have eggs for lunch and then I have something else for dinner. But if I'm, I don't always work at home and sometimes I'm in the metro area that I live in. Uh, so then, you know, I'll take my lunch with me you know, something like what I just described, um, usually high protein or some vegetables or something like that. I do have some berries every once in a while, but I'm not a huge fruit eater either at this point in my journey. And I am open to that changing and that be okay. But I'm still on a weight loss journey. So I'm in a different place than CJ is. Uh, when I travel, because I do travel for work, sometimes I'm away one night and sometimes I'm away three. Sometimes I fly, sometimes I drive. I am, I wish they had like a punch card at Longhorns. I swear I would have gotten like 30 free steaks by now because I eat there all the time. So I either have salmon or I have steak or I have lobster and my company pays for it and life is good. So, and then, you know, I noticed that at the very beginning, when I first got into sweet sobriety, you know, I was doing a lot of work. Um, I did the monthly classes, but I was usually kind of behind on the classes. I do go to at least four group meetings, most sometimes five. So Monday, Tuesday, twice on Thursday. I, I can't go to CJ's Tuesday group, which the amount that will heckles you, I don't think you need me. So, and I go on Saturday and so I usually have like my workout planned for the day, but sometimes when that happens, it just depends on work. Sometimes work goes sideways. No, work goes sideways all the time. So, you know, I have to just get it in when I can. Uh, so mine's pretty loose, but I, I know what I want to accomplish for the day, but but I found over the last few months, and we've been talking about this, I got a little passive and it showed up in that I was having a lot more struggles. So now I'm a little bit more regimented. I know what my goals are for the day outside of just the food and exercise because it's more than just that. Um, you know, I have to put in the work. And so, you know, I did my homework the past few days and there's a few, there's this big project at the house that's like, you know, trying to eat an elephant. Right. And so, you know, my goal every day is do 30 minutes, just do 30 minutes. That's all you got to do, you know, and eventually it will get done. And so like yesterday, uh, the day before I didn't get my 30 minutes in, it was just kind of a crazy day and that was okay. You know, it's like CJ said, it's not the end of the world. So yesterday I did 30 minutes and I said, nah, I feel like I could do 30 more. So I just went ahead and kind of made up for it. And I still got my other things done. So, you know, I put there, there are some deal breakers, right? Like eating cakes, not an option, right? But not spending 30 minutes on cleaning up the office. That's your big project. If I didn't make that goal for the day, that's not the end of the world. So, you know, the, there's the deal breaker ones and then there's the ones that aren't. So I don't watch a lot of TV anymore because I just, I don't have time for it right now. And I'm okay with that. I haven't really missed it. My dog's incredibly happy because he gets to sit down next to me while I do my homework and I watch my videos and, you know, I do all the things, but to, to CJ's point too. And I feel like I just reiterated everything that CJ said, the sleep thing is hugely important because not only did I notice 
that I wasn't losing weight when I wasn't getting appropriate sleep. When I started sleeping better, the weight came off faster for me. And in addition to that, when I really don't get my sleep now, that's when I'm not safe and I'm going to have harder time staying abstinent. And that's where I've had my slips has been when I've been really, really tired. So it's a huge priority for me as well. Uh, Yeah. So for me, uh, so I got some of these uh, tips and ideas from Katie and CJ. I guess uh, the little difference for me is that I have uh, cognitive issues that cause my sleep disturbance and energy and you know, I have problems with screen time, so so you'll see me. You may have noticed that I close my eyes or I look away from the screen a lot because it gives me headaches. And I don't read as much, and I used to do that all. I don't read at all, and I used to do that all the time. But I listen to podcasts, so I find alternatives. But I guess uh, the two things that I, I do, and I picked it up from Clarissa's procrastination course, and then Kate and CJ both gave me some of ideas that morphed into this is to predetermine what I'm going to do. So if I'm hungry, I'm going to eat this uh, and we're not going to get a Coca-Cola. And then I also, instead of being regimented, I have some th- I have things that I know that I want to do and I prioritize them. But there will be sometimes like I worked out this, I got up and worked out and then I was going to do a number of things after that. And I didn't do that. I went back to bed because I was just wiped out. And then the third thing, they didn't tell me to do this, but I kind of looked around and Katie was talking about how much Jack, her dog, meant to her. And CJ's got her, uh, her dog who are all cute, but I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I could take care of something as active as a dog. I mean, you got to take the dog outside, that sort of thing. So I got a cat, uh, maybe like three months ago named Hobson and I'm going to change his name to Alarm Clock because he, uh, what was that face, Katie? You better not change his name from Hobson. <laughs> I'm going to change it from Hobson to Alarm Clock because at 6.30, he starts in on the door and he doesn't stop until I get up. Uh, so... And, you know, you have to take care of a cat, of an inside cat. Now, I've automated it as much. He's got an automatic feeder. I don't know if he prefers wet food or dry food, but he's getting dry food because I can't put wet food in the automatic feeder. Uh, but, you know, you have to clean his, uh, clean his box and, and stuff like that. So it all works out. He, uh, he kills, uh, he kills all the crickets that get into my house and dismembers them. So it works out well. But, uh, seriously, I think, uh, for me, pre- uh, predetermining what I'm going to do and sort of ranking them on a hierarchy. And then, and then the other thing Katie just said, I guess I did this is limit. Like I had, cause I can, I can get on Twitter because, you know, it's really short stuff or it's videos and stuff like that. And I was following a lot of people and now I follow 12 people. And oh, by the way, Clarissa and Molly, y'all made the list. So yay team. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing, you know, those things that have worked so well for you and all of you. I think that all three of you are a huge inspiration. I love that you're in different parts of your journey and you're supporting each other through it. And we do have a signature question and I've kind of tried to reword it for you. So I want you to think about that younger version of yourself, maybe when you realized you had food addiction at that time. What is something that you needed to hear at that moment that at the beginning of your food addiction journey that would have maybe felt loved or supported? I guess for me, it probably would be, you're not the only one doing this. Like there are a lot of us in recovery and there are a lot of people who are abstinent and you, it's not as lonely as you think it is. And on top of that, it is worth the journey. It absolutely is worth the journey because on the other side of this, 
I think it, it might have been in y'all's podcast. I heard this. Oh, I remember where it came from now, and I'm not going to get it exactly correct. But what the podcaster was saying is that the person that you are now in the beginning of your journey is not the person that you're going to become. And the person that you're going to become will be there to catch you. And I was like, that it couldn't be more true because I didn't know that life was going to be this good when I started. I thought it was going to be a, have a lot less color, but what it has is it's more vibrant color in it. And the amazing people that I have met along the way, even if I didn't get all the recovery that I had, just the amount of people that I've been able to connect with and uh, who've helped me along the way has been amazing. And so, I mean, like I can feel the tears behind my eyes because I just feel so grateful, especially to Clarissa, Molly, and Dr. Tarman. I, and I can't believe in just not too long from now, I'll be in the same room with all of these people. I am so freaking excited about being at the conference. And I just feel so blessed and honored and so grateful to be on this journey. So that would be, that would be the biggest thing. I guess for me to say to a younger version of myself, I think about how I was raised in a way to be fiercely independent and not really need other people and just be a trailblazer. And I wish a, if I could tell anything to a younger person, I would say it's okay to need other people. It's, it's okay to need help. And even when you're in the gutter, it's okay. You, you weren't necessarily given all the tools you needed to navigate. Um, but there is a better way and, and you're going to make it. You're going to make it and it's going to be beautiful. I, I wouldn't change my story at all. If I could go back, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm not really ashamed of my addiction. It's just part of my story. And I think that I'm a really beautiful person who has a lot to share with the world. So I'm very grateful of you guys too. And I honestly, I told Molly this in an email. I kind of feel like a little bit of a celebrity even being on the podcast. So I'm very honored and I'm very grateful to be on my journey. And y'all have helped me so much um, because I was sober from opiates before I even showed up, but I never thrived like this. So it's a huge testament to the community that y'all have created. And I'm grateful to be a part of. So thank you. Well, we're a celebrity. Can we, can we adopt the, the, the song on the cover of the Rolling Stone on the food junkie podcast? I don't think it, there's too many syllables. Y'all got to rethink the name so we can come up with a cool song. Uh, quite frankly, to my, I mean, I'm talking about a really younger self is six, seven years. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I hear now, I heard from my mother. So I would have listened to mom more. And so, uh, I don't know. I, I guess, uh, I guess I, uh, in a certain way, less supportive of my choices and go, Hey, you dumbass, uh, don't do that. It's going to turn out badly. That's great, Bill. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I haven't totally, uh, I am on being supportive. Oh, yeah. so. Sorry, to, yeah. to the point. Yeah, that's <laughs> tough love. <laughs> you haven't been you haven't been around us long enough for the self compassion to absorb your mind and soul yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm always I'm always fascinated. Uh, we have these coaching sessions. I'm like, I don't remember any of my coaches in football uh, sounding anything like this. We did not work on our self compassion. It was more like when you were lying on the field hurt, they come out and say, get off my damn grass, you're killing the field. Well, I do appreciate what Will said about our mom. Well, first of all, you should always listen to your mom. I say that now because I am a mom and I really feel like my daughter should listen to me more. But our mom struggled for so many, for her entire life that I knew her, right? And she tried to show us a way to eat. We had a vegetable garden. We weren't allowed to have chocolate. We could only have carob. I mean, we were at the health food store. We we had a compost. We had a compost in 1976. 
Yeah, she tried, she tried, but she too didn't have the tools. You know, if you think about it, this was the 70s and the 80s when I feel like all that ultra processed food was in its infancy and kind of really making traction. And I mean, every Friday night I would go to my best friend's house so we could have a hamburger helper. Ugh, it just disgusts me to even think about that now. Right. Mom I, was mom mom was like uh the people that hit the the beach on Omaha Beach the first day and took ninety percent casualties. Yeah. So it's always She's ahead of her time. It's amazing, right? So <laughs> so you know, I think there's something to it, right? That some people had an inclination early on that things maybe weren't so good in the food environment or whatever it was, or we're trying to teach you the way that they grew up or whatever, right? But it is hard. I think, like you said, in the 70s, the late 70s, early 80s, that that industrialization of the food really took off and it was made to be convenient. It was made to be quick, right? It was made to make everything easier for families, especially because more women were going to work, right? They were working outside of the home. The divorce rate was high. So we have lots of single parents, you know, whatever it might be. So things like hamburger helper were really convenient, whatever it might've been. So Lord, you know, again, like God love her. She tried and you did, right. You all did the best you could. She did the best she could. You were influenced by something that was meant to influence you, you know, but you found your way into something better and something great at this point. I mean, I'm hearing all of you guys say life is good now and you wouldn't necessarily change your past because it got you to where you are today and you like where you are today and maybe will has a different version of that but just they, making sure. they said that they said that yeah i've changed a hell of a lot <laughs> figures oh god I'm, gl- I'm glad i'm glad i almost died that taught me so much the hell with that that's like everybody telling me that i was a. Uh, uh, so lucky to survive my wreck that it was so horrible. And I was so lucky. I was like, why was I not unlucky that I was in the wreck to start off with? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Fair, fair, fair. Amazing. Well, thank you guys so very much for being willing to be a part of the Food Junkies podcast and for yes. just sharing some, like some pretty vulnerable stuff with us. And just saying yes to us because I, for one, have enjoyed the last hour plus. I'm, I'm sure Clarissa has too. I mean, again, my face hurt before yeah, we started. My chipmunk cheeks exactly, are smiling. Exactly. It's, it's been a lot of fun and I just appreciate you guys. I always love seeing your faces in group. I'm always like, oh, what are we going to hear today? And I love it. I love it. You guys keep me on my toes and you keep my mind open. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. having us. You bet. Have a great rest of your day, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.